The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. What does regular order look like? That's what we're going to follow. And so I don't think there was anything untoward in what General Milley said in that episode. I'm David Priest, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 21st, 2021. A forthcoming book by Bob Woodward and Robert Costa contains reporting about several controversial actions by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, in late 2000 and early 2021 regarding conversations with his Chinese counterparts, his discussion with senior military officers about following standard nuclear procedures, if need be, and reaching out to others like the CIA and NSA directors to remind them to watch everything closely. Were each of these reported actions proper for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and why? And what about all of this coming out in books? To talk through it all, I gathered the A-Team on Civil-Military Relations. First, Peter Fever, who is a Civil-Military Relations expert at Duke University, where he also serves as Director of the Triangle Institute for Security Studies. He served in National Security Council staff positions in both the Bill Clinton and the George W. Bush administrations. He also had the misfortune of being on my dissertation committee back in the day. Corey Shockey is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy at the American Enterprise Institute, who has worked in the Joint Staffs J-5, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and in the National Security Council's staff, as well as the State Department's Policy Planning staff during Bush 43's administration. She has also researched and written extensively on civil-military relations. And Alex Vindman is Lawfare's Pritzker Military Fellow and a Visiting Fellow at Perry World House, His government experience includes multiple U.S. Army assignments and time inside the office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and in the National Security Council staff. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 21st. Milley, Trump, and Civil Military Relations with Peter Fever, Corey Shockey, and Alexander Vindman. Peter, let's start off with the the facts of the case as they are known. That is, and that may be a funny word to use here, facts, because what we have from what General Milley supposedly said and did is is filtered through the words in this new book as as written up. So we're not sure exactly what happened, but let's take the reporting at face value. What is it that General Milley is said to have done? Well, what uh, Woodward and Costa claim is that General Milley basically took over control of key policy decisions to protect the nation because Milley believed that the president and the people around him uh, might be inclined to do really reckless things. And so that was in the very last days of the administration, Milley was overstepping his role, but perhaps doing so because he had to, quote unquote, save the the country. That's the allegation. And whether that was in fact what General Milley was doing depends very much on the precise wording and accuracy of Woodward's reporting. I know from previous work that, that Woodward is very good about getting verbatim quotes from what people told him many months after the event. And of course, he's very good at getting the schedule and the calendar and even contemporaneous notes. But in this case, what really matters is the precise details. And so we can't be completely sure what happened. 
Well, let's break that down into the two elements that are getting the most attention. One of them is that General Milley reached out to his counterpart in China and essentially reassured him that things are a little bit crazy over here right now, but don't worry, things are fine. Don't get concerned, don't get trigger happy because of something happening here. Give us a little context for that. Because some people are reacting to that saying, and literally some people have used the word treason, saying that this is insane that he was talking to the, the Chinese military at a time of some domestic political dispute in the United States. Many other people who have worked within the national security structure and have analyzed it for years say, this is completely normal and what you expect someone at that senior most position to be doing on a regular basis. Talk through that a little bit. Well, first, let me provide two deeper points of context. And that is that if you're in evaluating General Milley, you have to view him as an Olympic diver and evaluate him on the difficulty of the dive that he was being asked to conduct. And if you just take from June 1, 2020, through the inauguration, those six plus months, that was the most difficult time for any chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from a civil military relations point of view, the most difficult time of our professional lives. So he was being asked to execute some of the most difficult Olympic dives ever. And that weighs in as we evaluate his performance. The second piece of context is to recognize that even by the summer of 2020, the process of the interagency process and national security policy making, policy implementation process of the Trump administration, a process that never was very clean, was breaking down. And then after the election, so from the election to the inauguration, it completely broke down altogether. And it was the messiest national security policy making implementation process again, of our professional lives in those last several weeks. So mm -hmm. those are two important pieces of context to keep in mind as we discuss specific charges. Now, to the specific charge of talking to the Chinese, that's actually part of Milley's regular job. He's supposed to develop mill-to-mill -mill relationships with other uh, senior military leaders, both in our allied partners and in our adversaries, so that in times of crisis, if we need a back channel, we have such a back channel, military to military. So he is supposed to talk to the Chinese, and that is not unusual that he was doing so, point one. Point two is he was doing so in the October call, according to Woodward's reporting, he was doing so at the direction of Esper. Right, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Defense at the time. So he had top cover. Now we could ask, was there adequate coordination between uh, Esper and Milley on the one hand and the White House on the other hand? Maybe not. <laughs> but that just points to the my earlier context point regarding how process was breaking down in inside the Trump administration. We should say the spokesperson of the Joint Staff did issue a statement saying that the chairman, as you've just said, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs regularly communicates with chiefs of defense around the world, including with China and Russia, and that his calls with the Chinese and others in October were in keeping with these duties and responsibilities conveying reassurance in order to maintain strategic stability. The specific context for the October call is precisely when a Milley would be duty bound to make the call. That is, according to reporting, the United States had reason to believe that the Chinese were misunderstanding what was going on and were believing that the U.S. might be planning a sneak attack. And they were taking steps in accordance with that fear. That was not what the U.S. policy was. Uh, President Trump himself has said, no, I had no plans to conduct a sneak attack. And therefore, when General Milley is reassuring the Chinese about what U.S. policy actually was, he was merely conveying what was President Trump's actual policy. 
which was, I'm not about to conduct a sneak attack. And so this kind of reassurance, confidence building measures is best practice in crisis management and best practice in civil military relations and is not problematic. However, the precise wording of what he said to the Chinese, as reported by Woodward and Costa, uh, you could raise some questions about that. And so I would imagine when General Milley does his testimony before Congress in a couple of weeks, they'll ask him about the precise wording and he'll clarify whether he said exactly what Woodward claims he said or whether he said something else that is perhaps less problematic. And what would cross the line from a civ mill perspective from this is not only acceptable for a chairman to do, but it is precisely what the chairman should do at some direction from the Secretary of Defense, the civilian authority here, what would cross the line if he said X to the Chinese, you would say he has exceeded his authority and done something that is inappropriate? If he made a blanket promise that forever and into the future that the United States will never attack China without General Milley first alerting the Chinese, that would go beyond his remit. But I doubt that he made such a blanket promise. I think more likely what he said is, look, we have no intention of attacking you now. That's true. And if we ever find ourselves in a crisis, you will know that we're in a crisis and we'll both know we're in a crisis and there won't be any ambiguity about it, which is also a reasonable thing to say. And So I suspect that he said something like that rather than the precise wording as reported in in Woodward and Costa, which gave the appearance of a blanket promise in perpetuity that would commit the United States. I have another question about how he could cross the line in that call with the Chinese, but a little bit of context for that question first. Last summer, Jim Shudo published the book, The Madman Theory, Trump Takes on the World. And in there, he had several other senior officials in the Trump administration saying things like, we had Trump as unpredictable, and I would communicate that. And this is from Trump's special representative for North Korea policy, talking about communicating to the North Koreans that Trump was unpredictable. You had Mick Mulroy, I believe, who was working as the deputy Assistant Secretary, the DASD for Middle East, saying, we told allies that we did not know what the president would be willing to do. Now, that leads me to ask, apart from the issue of Milley promising we will never attack you for the rest of time, could he also have been inappropriate by denigrating his own commander in chief? What would he say to the Chinese about the president himself that you think would cross that line of civ mill appropriateness? Well, I'm not going to speculate on what awful things could be said that would cross the line. But in response to the specific question you're asking, uh, that was reference to a strategy that was attempted for a while vis-a-vis North Korea. When they were trying the maximum pressure approach with North Korea and they were rattling the cage, this is now back in 2017, 2018, early 2018. And during that phase, it was clear that the Trump administration was cultivating the idea of, you just don't know what this president would do, so you better get on side. Similar to what was alleged to have been done by Kissinger and Nixon back in the day. Now, if if Milley had countermanded that at the time, of course, he wasn't the chairman at the time, but if If that had been the strategy and he was undermining it, then that would be a violation of Civ Mill best practices. But of course, that wasn't the case in October, November 2020. And so uh, Milley was was on the right side. Now, you could raise other questions about the January call, which was the second call that Woodward and Costa reported on. And that had to do with uh, the Chinese calling Milley, this time after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And at this point, the Chinese apparently are freaking out because they're watching TV and thinking that the American system is falling apart. 
Uh, they weren't the only ones who were worried about that, by the way. But it was appropriate for Millie to take the call and to reassure the Chinese that, you know, democracy can be messy, but we're going to have a peaceful transition. This is all going to work itself out and do not take precipitous action, China, because we're going to have a transition. That's right. an appropriate message to send. Mm -hmm. It was coordinated with other people in OSD, according to uh, Millie's spokesperson. Whether it was coordinated with the then acting Secretary of Defense, Miller, is in some dispute. Miller claims it was not. But that just underscores my first point about how chaotic the process was by this point. It really was breaking down. And so uh, I'm not surprised that there would be some loose ends in January because the whole ball of yarn was unraveling by that point. Okay, that's the China side. And I do want to get reactions from Corey and Alex on that. But first, Peter, I know you have to go. So I want to get your take on the second part of this reporting, which is that Milley had a meeting in the Pentagon. And here, here's how it's written up in the book. He said to the people in charge of senior military officials at the Pentagon in the National Military Command Center, no matter what you are told, you do the procedure, you do the process, and I'm part of that procedure, referring to any possible deployment of nuclear weapons. What's your take on him having a meeting of senior officials and telling them to follow the established process for the use of nuclear weapons? Well, Milley is in the chain of communication, but not the chain of command. So mm -hmm. under normal procedures, orders pass from the president, exec sec to exec sec to the Department of Defense. To play that out, the president communicates, you would think, through the executive secretary of the National Security Council to the executive secretary at the Pentagon for the Secretary of Defense? Yes. Okay. And that by, by going through executive secretary, that means that the paper has been gone through the staff secretary at the White House, uh -huh. which means that legal has weighed in on it. Uh, all uh, the White House chief of staff has weighed in on it. The National Security Advisor has weighed in on it. So everyone who has responsibility has double checked to make sure that this order is legal and uh, corresponds with what the president has intended to do. Then it goes across exec sec to the Defense Department, where the Secretary of Defense receives it. They, you know, check to make sure that 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 indeed is what was, you know, their understanding of what had been decided. And from there passes down to the combatant commanders via the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not as a chain of command uh, matter, but just in, he's in the communications loop. So he's aware of what's happening. And that's regular order. And here's where I need to flag something that what I call the naive theory of American civil military relations. And the naive theory thinks that, you know, civilian control is so paramount and that civilian control means that the military is like an automaton ready to respond reflexively to the first words uttered by a civilian. And then they jump unthinkingly in response to that. Uh, that's not how uh, civil military relations works. It's it's better understood as operating within a context, within a system where there's regular procedures and where someone calling from with a 202456 phone number, that's the White House exchange, can't just call over and say, hey, you know, let the missiles fly because that's not a regular order. It's got to pass through the, the proper channels. And if the military receives something that's not through proper channels, they're not being insubordinate. They're not undermining civilian control. If they ask for clarification, can we get this through the regular orders, the regular uh, process, please, uh, then we'll do it. And that protects the country. That protects the country from things like Iran-Contra, where someone might be saying they're acting in the name of the president, but has it been properly vetted by legal and by everybody else? And so when Milley was having that conversation with the NMCC, what I took him to be saying was precisely this, which is a teaching point for professional military education. 
The process is your friend. Get this done through proper channels. Make sure the things are legal. Then you execute a legal order, even if you don't like it. But if things are coming through irregularly, double check before you act. And of course, he felt the need to do that. He merely felt the need to send that message again, precisely because the process had broken down so completely and people were hand carrying over orders that may or may not have been signed by the president that hadn't been staffed properly at the White House or the the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And when Milley received that and said, wait a second, we got to get this checked out, he goes back to the Oval Office, they check it out, and the president says, uh, no, that's not what I want to do. In other words, countermands that, that piece of paper. Well, in such an environment, it's really important that everybody is reminded, what does regular order look like? That's what we're going to follow. And so I don't think there was anything untoward in what General Milley said in that episode. That is useful background, in part because some of the characterization around the quotes uh, is a little more extreme than that. You know, saying in, in the book, Milley took extraordinary action and called this secret meeting in a Pentagon office. Well, it's, it's extraordinary, perhaps because the times were extraordinary, but reminding senior officials to follow the procedure certainly doesn't warrant that adjective. And a secret meeting in the Pentagon, well, I, I think most meetings of senior military officials are secret. They're, they're not broadcast live on the internet. So perhaps some of that just comes from the description around it more than the facts of the case. Before I let you go, though, I do have to ask you one more thing. There is also reporting in the book that Milley had decided at the time when it looked like the domestic situation in the U.S. was was spinning out of control, that he told his top service chiefs to watch everything all the time. And he called the directors of the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency and asked them to keep watching everything. Woodward and Costa write, and this is their quote, that some might contend that Milley had overstepped his authority and taken extraordinary power for himself. What's your take on that? The, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs reaching out to other senior national security leaders, telling them to just keep an eye on everything during a tense time. Is that inappropriate and extraordinary power grabbing, or is that good government? Right. This is uh, where Woodward and Costa, but also lots and lots of other commentators, are claiming that Milley is ha having a Hague moment. He's acting like Secretary Hague did after Reagan was shot and sort of usurping control and misidentifying the chain of succession, as Haig did in his uh, famous White House press presser. Right. But in fact, what uh, Milley was doing, I think, was more of a Schlesinger moment, <laughs> where Schlesinger quietly reached out, uh, is reported to have quietly reached out to his people inside the Department of Defense in the last days of Watergate before Nixon resigned, just to remind them, okay, what's regular order? What does normal look like? And we're going to stay well within the bounds of normal and not get uh, out of bounds in any way. And that's a Schlesinger moment, not a Hague moment. And I think that's what Milley was doing. It was an extraordinary time for, for the country. As I said, the breakdown in the process in the Trump administration in those last weeks, that was exceptionally dangerous for a variety of reasons. And then, of course, you have the public disorder culminating with an attempt to disrupt the constitutional process of uh, authorizing mm -hmm. the uh, electoral mm -hmm. votes. All of that was really extraordinary times, and it was wise for the national security apparatus to be alert, but not primed to overreact and not sleeping so they could they would underreact. And I think that's a responsible message that was being sent. Let me just be clear, though. I'm not saying that every word that General Milley said uh, is perfect. I'm prepared to believe that, to go back to my metaphor about the Olympic dive, that he may have kicked up some spray with this or that phrasing. But 
again, go to uh, the difficulty of the dive he was having to conduct. And I think uh, I'm willing to cut him some slack. All right, let's address each of these in turn, Alex and Corey. First to you, Alex, let's address the, the first point there, that Millie, according to this reporting, and according to his own admission in the statement that his spokesperson put out, did talk to Chinese senior officials to reassure them at this time, as many others in, in history have done during tense times with the Soviet Union and with other countries that were not exactly treaty allies. What's your take on the appropriateness of General Milley speaking to the Chinese during this time of potential misunderstanding and confusion about what was happening in the United States? Well, I think I, I, I certainly agree with Peter that these are relatively routine phone calls under not routine circumstances. And the substance of the calls themselves or the process behind uh, how these phone calls were coordinated is not something I have you know, much clarity on. But I think the calls themselves are appropriate. The fact that we're, we're both communicating with adversaries as well as al- allies about kind of the state of uh, military to military relations, those are totally fine. As a matter of fact, I participated in probably a dozen of these things uh, on the Russia side of the equation. And uh, there were many people in the room. They were well coordinated both ahead of time within the Department of Defense, within the joint staff within the interagency. And then there was a uh, readout afterwards of, of these things. So again, if they're they're adhering to kind of established norms and checking uh, talking points, right. and in particular with a place like Russia and China, that becomes even more critical because there are multiple portions of the government that are interacting with multiple portions of the Chinese government. And the Chinese government tends to be relatively coordinated. Uh, so we need to be as coordinated. Now, with regards to some of the data points, frankly, I was dismissive of at least the line in Woodward's uh, book that talks about the chairman warning China about potential attacks. That to me seemed absurd. I do not believe in any way that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, somebody that's been committed to uh, national defense for decades, would warn an adversary. So that there is something that, you know, that we'll have to see a little bit more clearly what comes out on that one. But I just didn't buy it because it didn't resonate that the, right. the chairman would do that. But the call itself right. is, is is not an issue. And, and we don't we don't have clarity on what exactly was said. Even the the statement from the spokesperson at the joint staff simply said his calls with the Chinese and others in October and January were in keeping with these duties and responsibilities, conveying reassurance in order to maintain strategic stability. All good words, they fit together well, but they don't tell us exactly what was said when it comes to a potential warning. I would just say, you know, again, the the process does matter somewhat because they just need to be really well coordinated based on multiple touch points between between our government sure. and the Chinese government, and uh, we we need to be synchronized. So, not being aware of any uh, shortfalls there, I, I don't really have any concerns with those calls. Okay, Corey, you also were on the staff of the joint staff (laughs) at one point. And you also have a window into these calls. And what do you think about the appropriateness just of that part of Millie calling the Chinese, talking to the Chinese about the situation? Yeah, I agree with Alex that the Woodward Costa book makes this sound incredibly dangerous and and as they were hiding the information from everybody else in the American government. And that's not only not the way that staffs work, there'd be a whole bunch of preparation for a call like that. But it also avoids engaging any of the other possible explanations, like the fact that we are striving to create a stable military to military channel of communications with the Chinese Mm -hmm. for reasons that have nothing to do with President Trump's behavior or the challenges on January 6th. That is, we want to be able to have a dampening effect in crises by having established relationships and military channels. It's a good thing he was talking to the Chinese. I share Alex's judgment that it's profoundly unlikely that a senior American military officer would alert a potential adversary. 
And I think in general, the Costa and Woodward descriptions are breathless and unfair to General Milley. Hello, beautiful. I'm Amy Errett, founder of Madison Reed, a hair color company I named after my daughter. Experience gorgeous, lasting, high quality hair color made with ingredients you could feel good about with consistent results every time. It's easy to find your perfect shade. Book a complimentary video hair color consultation with a licensed colorist on madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code RADIO10. That's code RADIO10. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. I am curious, and of course, this is just speculation, if a comment like, you know, don't worry, if there's an actual attack, you'll know it. Somebody saying that almost tongue in cheek to a counterpart overseas could be heard by somebody as I will give you a warning of an attack when it probably wouldn't have been meant that way. Well, you know, when you are talking to somebody who's not a speaker of your language, and it's in a formal diplomatic context, they tend not to skate close to areas of misinterpretation. (laughs) Like the communication tends to be pretty simple and pretty straightforward to make sure that interpreters don't, you know, get a nuance wrong. So again, I think it's unlikely that he was skating close to the line of, you know, laughing, saying, oh, you'll know it when it happens. Because, I mean, that's the kind of joke you might make with the Australians or the Canadians, right? Who you have a close understanding, jocular relationship with. General Milley doesn't have that kind of relationship with his Chinese counterparts. So I think it unlikely. That's a fair point. Corey, let me come back to you on on this point, because I think we have the potential for a little bit more disagreement between Peter and you and Alex on the second main area of reporting, which was that that the chairman actually met with senior military officials and said, no matter what you are told, you follow the procedure and I am in that procedure. Corey, your take first, and then Alex will will come to you on it. So for me, this is another example of the way Costa and Woodward are sexing up the dossier as they said about the Blair government with intelligence on Iraq, you know, in a fraught time where partisan politics are so vituperative in the United States and the president himself was so unreliable, it's not dangerous or wrong for the senior military leadership to get together and say, okay, everybody, let's make sure that things work how they're supposed to. And, you know, I want to know what's happening. It's not actually wrong or dangerous for the senior military officer in the United States to want to know what's being communicated to commanders in operational billets from the White House. You know, they make it sound like Milley was inserting himself into the nuclear chain of command, as opposed to saying, hey, folks, I want to make sure everybody's got eyes on what's happening. Uh, Make sure you are telling other people what's going on as our procedures require us to do. This is one of those cases where the write-ups and the sensationalist take on the, the quotes were probably more dramatic than the quotes themselves. But we can get to that in more detail. Alex, this is an area that you've seemed to say in your Washington Post op-ed and elsewhere, that this is a little bit more disturbing for you than the the Chinese phone call. Explain what you think the danger is here and how the nuances will matter. Sure. So here, I think uh, I take a different perspective than uh, Peter and uh, Corey. In my view, there is some legalistic language in this reported conversation 
with these di uh, directors of operation on the National Military Command in the National Military Command Center. I had a chance to work in the command center for for a kind of a four month stint. So I understand how the process works. I think what the chairman was attempting to do here was attempting to, you know, again, in a legalistic manner, something cleared by attorneys indicate that no action can be taken without the chairman's you know, presence and the chairman's consent. You know, that's what he's communicating to subordinates within his chain command. These are one star generals or admirals that are going to, you know, take what the, the chairman says very, very seriously. And what folks don't necessarily understand is that the president of the United States could seek the chairman's advice, the best military advice, seek the chairman's input, but it's not required. And if the president so chooses not to consult with the chairman, then there is no role for the chairman in that process, except, you know, again, in that very, very formalistic view that Peter had ab about communications through exec sex and all that. That's true. I've seen that play out. But that does not is not the way that the, the nuclear command and control works. And, you know, it's it's a very sensitive area, uh, which we can't really get into in, in greater detail. But those are not in any way similar channels. They're they're designed to be far, far more streamlined, designed to respond to crises with really kind of the only the chief executive uh, as the potential authority. And there is less about proper procedures. I mean, Let's just say that as long as the president authenticates uh, his identity, he could execute whatever nuclear direction he, he wishes to provide. But there's a bigger issue in play here. You know, this is an example of what I would like to refer to as doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. Believing that he needed to be a guardrail against, you know, a madman president, to put it in, in the most stark terms. And we've now heard... The chairman's uh, representatives represent his position on uh, the fears he had around Donald Trump in the waning days, you know, the Reichstag moment, potential, you know, ordering nuclear war to retain power. Those are all potentially legitimate concerns. But what were the chairman's real options in dealing with this? In my view, it was not necessarily uh, looking to, you know, in a, in a legalistic way, subvert the, the chain of command civilian control, it was to go on record, resign, say, this is, these are the concerns I had. This is why I resigned. And I refer to it in my article about, you know, what Secretary Mattis had done in uh, Syria, where he resigned based on a very poorly considered knee-jerk reaction to withdrawing troops from Syria and put himself on record and actually, frankly, got the president to reverse course. And that's something that people don't recognize is that the president reversed course on multiple decisions behind the scenes when challenged and when he thought that pursuing that course of action would be fraught, even though he may have tweeted or made a remark about it. And I think that instead of taking the actions that, that the chairman did, he could have stepped aside, reported what he was concerned about, and had any number of other senior generals step in and do that role as well, if not better. It's something that we train our military to do. Uh, we call them fallout drills where your subordinate steps in and does that role. And, and this is not like a whimsical statement. You have a vice chairman that would step into that position as soon as the, the chairman is is unavailable or, or resigns. And there is not this idea of like, you know, putting in and acting. That's just not the way it would work, not in, a, in a, like a hasty right. manner. It would right. unfold over the course of days. Let me press pause there because you've covered a lot of grounds on the, the various steps and how you interpret what was said about the, the chain of communication versus the chain of command. But I want to give Corey a chance to either agree or, or disagree on each of those steps you laid out. And then I may try to step in for Peter, who unfortunately had to step out because as a former graduate student of his from many years ago, I internalized <laughs> some of his writing and thinking on civil military relations and knowledge of the literature. And I'm happy to, to weigh in there but Corey, you get first shot. What do you agree with Alex on in this? And what do you disagree with him on? So I agree with Alex that the chain of nuclear release goes directly from the president to operational commanders, as does the chain for operational orders of a conventional nature. But where I disagree with him is encouraging senior military people to resign over policies they think are wrong 
is bad for civil military relations. Talk through that a little bit, because that that yeah. may sound counterintuitive because of the example of Mattis. Now, of course, Jim Mattis was <laughs> Jim Mattis wasn't a uniform. He was not a senior military officer. official. He had he had stepped in as the civilian right. Secretary of Defense. But it may sound so, counterintuitive to people. Parenthetically, this the confusion that you know we are having on this conversation right now is one of the reasons not to appoint a recently retired military officer right to on. be a civilian yep. Secretary of Defense. Civilian cabinet members have a responsibility to carry out the president's political plan. And if they can't do it, they have a responsibility to resign because they accepted a cabinet appointment to mm -hmm. carry out the president's policies. Mm -hmm. It's a different equation for serving military officers. If the order is legal and moral, and that's narrowly defined moral, so no war crimes, then you have a responsibility to carry out that order. If you can't do it in good faith, you should resign your commission. But a couple of things. The president has every right to receive military advice that they don't take. And they have every right to receive military advice confidentially. It does an enormous amount of damage to civil military relations if the president thinks he can't have a conversation in a room military officers are in that he's not going to have to defend publicly. And that will lead to presidents choosing political generals. And that too is a bad outcome for civil military relations to vet people by their politics rather than trusting that that the oath that they take is what binds them. Again, it's a very fast path to a very politicized military and to the collapse of trust between elected officials and military serving military officers. Sure. And I will point out that even one of the co-authors of the, the new book, Robert Costa, said, I believe on Good Morning America, clarifying the writing and reporting that Oh, no, we weren't actually as concerned as the reporting makes it sound that that he was acting outside of procedure. He was doing what would normally be done of reminding people in a stressful time to keep communication lines open. Before uh, the point in time at which the book describes this, there was a prior instance of the president reaching out directly to NORTHCOM to issue orders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense were unaware of it when it was happening. So, you know, it wasn't a bolt out of the blue that General Milley just got the idea to tell everybody that, you know, make the process work, consult with us, because, you know, the senior uh, Washington-based people have a better feel for what's going on in the politics of the moment than do operational commanders, because that's not the operational commander's job. So making sure they have context about what's happening is also a part of the chairman's responsibilities. And I don't think there was anything wrong with what General Milley was doing to try and make sure that there was visibility and accountability throughout the process. Alex, your turn to respond to any of those points or reflect on uh, any of these issues that they raise. Sure. So I think Corey is exactly right. We don't want our generals stepping in and politicizing themselves. But in a way, that's exactly what General Milley has done in this case. He's through either directly or through proxies has taken a position, a public position in which he had deep concerns about the president. But instead of acting on those deep concerns at the moment, uh, he, uh, what I would say, would um, maneuvered around the president in order to establish some guardrails. That, to me, is a very troubling indicator. And now, you know, now the, it looks like, you know, the, the chairman, either directly or through proxies, is going on the record with these concerns, politicizing himself, politicizing the office. And this right. is not a chairman that in, in certain ways is new to this. We saw the chairman become a political hot potato as early as uh, uh, the summer of 2020 
when he was drawn into, uh, su- you know, basically indicating the military was supportive of, of suppressing peaceful protests in uh, Lafayette Square after there was a, a, you know, after the George Floyd protests. And we saw the same thing unfold in the early days of 2021 uh, with regards to January 6th coming in on, on record in a light touch manner, uh, having conversations with, with Secretary Pelosi. And now, much, much more clearly in reporting from Susan Glasser, from uh, Carol Leonig, and from Bob Boardward, sharing deep concerns. And I think, frankly, if the, the chairman uh, had chosen to you know, stay above the fray and let you know history judge his actions, I think nobody would be saying anything about this. I mean, they would judge him based on the merits, uh, as historians tend to do, uh, collecting a uh, number of facts. But that's not what's happening. Now we have a chairman that's deeply polarizing. At one point, uh, polarizing for the left, now polarizing for right. And that is just bad for the institution, uh, institution of the military, for the Department of Defense, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I find it interesting, you know, that we we did have an example of a previously serving chairman in the opening days of of the Trump administration that managed to to stay out of these types of controversies, uh, but Milley has has not. And then just uh, lastly on this, you know, this idea of you know, whether he should have resigned. Optimally, no, but this was definitely far from an optimal situation. And I think you know more appropriate action would would have been to take to resign and speak his piece when it would have made a difference rather than hold and then meter out the information months down the road. That's the the better, in my view, of the options uh, rather than what we're seeing now, which is, you know, again, deeply politicizing the office on both sides of the aisle. Okay, let me let me push back on that part, because it sounds like a lot of your energy and a lot of your passion for this is coming not so much from the report about what General Milley actually did at the time, but more so for the fact that he has been, uh, maybe I'll use Corey's own words here from the New York Times, that General Milley either has the most indiscreet circle of acquaintances in Washington, or he's authorizing it to reshape his image. Alex, (laughs) it sounds like you're more upset with General Milley for how he has been talking with various authors or explicitly or implicitly endorsing comments from those around him to talk to the media than you are for the actions themselves as described in the new reporting. Is that right? And then, Corey, I'll let you actually say what you meant to write if I uh, mischaracterized it. I think that's generally right. I don't want to discount the reporting as it's coming out. And those are the firm questions that he needs to address on, I think, uh, the 28th when he testifies for the January 6th commission. But I think there is a precedent where lower level officers have been considered politicized or political animals or drawn into, uh, you know, let's say reluctantly drawn into political affairs and uh, found themselves outside of the organization, uh, outside the institution. I think that the bar should be higher, the higher up the chain you go. The bar should be higher for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs than for for folks that are lower down the, the, the rank structure. Okay, Corey, back to you. Uh, the New York Times article I referred to was was your piece talking about how problematic for civil military relations all of these comments coming out about what General Milley thought and believed in various conversations and ascribing noble motives to everything he did. I was wondering if you could talk through that as a way of uh, bringing this conversation back to what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate with General Milley's actions in the last year. Sure, David. I guess the first thing I would say is if I were General Milley, I would demand to be graded like Olympic diving. You and Peter love Olympic diving. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but but it's the right example, right? Has any chairman ever had a more problematic balance to strike? Given the depth of polarization and given the populist effort by President Trump and many of his supporters to destroy the restraints of our democratic government. So what he's doing is legitimately difficult, and I'm sympathetic to that difficulty. But I agree with Alex that, you know, I haven't yet read an account that doesn't purport 
to know what General Milley was thinking and exactly quoting him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's a civil military infraction because it encourages political leaders to believe they cannot have a confidential conversation if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is in the room. And that means they are going to exclude the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from sensitive conversations, Hmm. which means she or he will not be present to offer their counsel. Or if they are present, their counsel will be discounted because they are presumed to be political actors, just like everyone else in the room. So I'm sympathetic to why he's, maybe he's just therapeutically talking to all of his friends about how hard his job is. But I agree with Alex that greater discretion is actually a part of his job. And I'll make a presumption myself here, which is that Peter probably would agree with both of you if if he were here about the danger to appropriate civil military relations of a a chairman who appears eager to be burnishing his image in the media. And maybe there's another area of agreement for all of you. Um, This is the other area that we spoke about earlier, the reporting that Milley spoke not only with service chiefs, but also with the director of the CIA and the director of the NSA, just to remind them to keep a watch on everything, that these were obviously very sensitive times and everybody should make sure that their antenna were up. Alex, does that sound like a normal thing for senior national security leaders to be doing, just touching base with each other and making sure everybody knows that this is a sensitive time and uh, keep in touch if you see anything? I think we want our senior leaders to have open channels of communication, but I've had a chance to to interact with Chairman uh, Milley or General Milley on multiple occasions, at least a half a dozen times. And I'm concerned that there are indiscretions of communicating these types of things, either publicly or uh, even kind of behind closed doors. I mean, I frankly find it troubling that he need, he thought he needed to r- remind you know, the head of the CIA or other departments and agencies to pay attention as if they had no idea what was going on. Uh, I think that's a kind of a comical notion. Mm-hmm. And the same way that, you know, he may have uh, in the closing, like Corey pointed out, you know, everything is quite well scripted, especially with our key adversaries, Russia and China. But in the closing moments of a conversation, joking about like, you'll know that, you know, there there's going to be a, uh, an issue if we go to war. Those types of things uh, indicate some sort of, I don't know, I guess this is pretty harsh, but maybe some issues with regards to judgment that ha- having folks talk to the media about these th- these issues that he or these concerns he had also seems to substantiate. Yep. Corey, let me ask you for that, because I can imagine in a principles committee meeting that the chairman is, is attending the fact that a secretary of defense and a chairman of the joint chiefs and a, a head of the CIA who's who's there as well in the back, all of them saying to each other in that setting, everybody, let's let's make sure we keep an eye on everything. And they all nod and go back to their agencies and departments. That seems natural and probably good government. But when it's these phone calls being made one on one saying, you know, hey, just want you to keep an eye on everything. You know what I mean? It, it does make it sound a little bit different, doesn't it? It does make it sound a little bit different. But again, remember how extraordinary the circumstances in which they were operating under was. And something that hasn't yet come up in our conversation here, that you had an acting secretary of defense, you had the Trump administration flowing, you know, people more personally committed to the president than before, right? Doug McGregor and Kash Patel headed over there. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible General Milley felt like he didn't have anybody to talk to in his own place and wanted to make sure he was getting good information that ordinarily would flow through the chain of command. So it's not at all clear to me that there is anything untoward about those conversations. You know, I maybe I'll just come back on this one. Look, I'll use a baseball analogy rather than a diving Olympic diving analogy. How many strikes before you're out? I mean, uh, there was the stroll through 
Lafayette Square. There, there are the deep concerns which he's he's going to be testifying about with regards to the response on January 6th. There is Afghanistan and uh, being on the record about how things were going to unfold with regards to Afghanistan that informed in part President Biden's decision about, you know, the, the steps he could take on withdrawal. And now we have a series of reports. Again, I think it, he is he's too controversial a chairman. And when I know that there are as competent, if not more competent uh, folks that could do the job and he's he served his country country extremely honorably for decades he has a uh an um, an amazing record but it might be time to step aside and let the country kind of heal as a, as a private citizen he could talk about these different issues he, that he's experienced or or his side of the equation we do not need a politicized chairman of the joint chiefs boy i strongly disagree with alex i think either general milley resigning or being fired will dramatically further the politicization of the chairman's role. And civil military relations are much better served by having a chairman remain in place, whether or not you like his policy advice on the issues Alex outlined, rather than encouraging them to be fired and replaced in the midst of a four-year term. I'm not sure. That doesn't seem logical to me, uh, David, that, that having somebody that's flawed and politicized stay on, you know, is somehow less harmful than having somebody that's not tainted. But I think this is one of those situations where uh, we could respectfully agree to disagree, which is frankly something that is too short in, in uh, within our discourse around sensitive issues. So I, I'm happy to have a conversation in that manner. Sure. And on that, we agree. There's one other area that I, I wonder if we will agree, and maybe we'll close with this. Let us assume that General Milley does not resign and that President Biden does not demand his resignation or fire him. What do chairman of, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the future need to learn from this? There's one lesson that I think everyone agrees on, but then there might be some slight differences in terms of actions and behaviors going forward. So Corey and, and then Alex, what do you think a chairman should do and shouldn't do either right now or as a lesson learned from this entire episode? I think a lesson that future chairmen should learn was taught to us all by the great defense attorney, Clarence Darrow, which is no man was ever convicted based on testimony he did not give. A second lesson that I think every chairman present and future should learn is that what passes for political in the American military is nowhere as ruthless and high speed as actual full-time politicians. Mm -hmm. And we should prefer having the problems of a military leadership that is naive and incapable of navigating politics than we should want the problems associated with a military leadership that views itself as political actors. We will have worse outcomes if that should happen. Okay. And Alex, what's a lesson? Again, assuming no resignation here and maybe not even assuming that it's General Milley, but a generic future chairman, what is the thing that she or he should be keeping in mind from this whole episode? I think I want to emphasize what Corey said, because those were excellent points you made. And I think the the discretion point is extremely uh, appropriate for, for this particular chairman. I think there are good precedents, even within the Trump administration, of chairman sticking closely to the principles of providing best military advice and not seeking to kind of read the political tea leaves. And I think that's a, a lesson that I'm sure future uh, four stars and chairman will draw out of these episodes. And a sincere thank you to Peter, Corey, and Alex for sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share the podcast and rate the podcast and also share it on the social media of your choice. This episode is edited and produced by Jen Pacha Howell. Hamza Shatu is our audio engineer. Sophia Yan performed our music. As always, thanks for listening.
Experience gorgeous, lasting, high-quality hair color with Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code RADIO10.